following is the talk given at the Knock Shrine Annual Novena on Friday the 14th of August 1998. The speaker is Father Seamus Ryan and his theme is 2,000 Years On and Living in Hope. 1998. We take our system of dating very much for granted. And yet for the first 600 years of Christianity, for example, when St. Patrick walked here on the, the hills of Connacht, uh, he, the years were dated in a very different way. The year was numbered from the foundation of the city of Rome, and that's the way St. Patrick would have counted the years. Or sometimes by reference to a particular Roman emperor. If you remember when St. Luke starts the account of the ministry of Jesus, he says, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, the word of God came to John the Baptist in the wilderness. And prior to the history of Rome, the years were dated by the particular Greek Olympic Games that had taken place in, the, in those four years. To me, there's something particularly comforting and even exciting that in our sometimes extremely secular world of today, we date our calendar, nearly all the countries of the world, with few exceptions, from the birth of the child in Bethlehem in terms of B.C. 100 B.C. means 100 years before the birth of Jesus. A.D. means Anno Domini, literally, literally 200 A.D., 200 years from the year of the Lord. And the birth of a child in Bethlehem at a time when the Roman Empire was at its height, full of pride and crime, like our present civilization. Yet we date our calendar across the world, not from Caesar and not from Plato, but from a child, a child born to Mary of Nazareth, a child who will change the face of the world. And so we go limping into a third millennium as a Christian people. I, I chose that word I suppose deliberately, limping, needing healing in our church, in our world, in our country. Yet though we are limping and wounded, we are still here after 2,000 years. And that's something to be grateful to God for, and something that's extraordinary. We think of our little survives after 2,000 years. It's not a matter for pride or for triumphalism, but surely grounds for thanks and grounds for hope, which is our theme of, 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 of today's Mass. Hope. And that poses a problem, because there are two sides to life. There is a dark, evil side to life that includes suffering and sickness and war and death, kind of terrible things we've seen happen even this past week with bombs in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam, things we're so sadly so accustomed to in our own country. Horrific things happen, and our science, the scientists are telling us about the ultimate oblivion when our earth, in millions of years hence, they say, will fall into a dying sun. Nothing, people say, really matters. Life has no meaning. More people say that today than ever. The sad incidences of even of suicide in our own country to bear that out. That life for more people than ever before is absurd and has no meaning. On the other side, there is the best side of our humanity, tells us that everything matters. That our task is to make this world the best place we can. We call it in our own Christian language, building God's kingdom. The best place we can make it for everybody now. That everything matters. Everything. Henri Nouwen, a famous writer who died at a young, relatively young age this past year, has wonderful things to say about hope. Hope is daring to stay open to whatever today will bring or tomorrow. To go fearlessly into things without knowing how they will turn out. A kind of trust that life has a meaning and that's planted in the very marrow of our bone and of our flesh. I suppose there are many people today who think of life as a kind of neutral thing. We're born to enter in, into it and it's neither good nor bad except the way we make it and live it. We may make it an empty life, we may make it a full life. But life itself, many increasing people say anyhow, does not care one way or another any more than the ocean cares whether we sink or we drown in it. And I suppose we all of us, and I must admit myself too at times, you feel the power of that sort of, you know, secular philosophy. 
but rightly or wrongly, the Christian faith flatly contradicts it. To say that there is a God, the Christian God, the Father of Jesus, is to say that life does care, that the life-giving power out of which life comes is not indifferent to whether we sink or whether we swim. It wants us very much to swim. It is to say that the Spirit of God, or call it what you will, in other traditions of the Muslim, I call it Allah, or the Jews will call it Yahweh, but that life is there and it's on, it's on our side, and it wishes us to succeed and works with us for success. It comes from the reality that deep within, wherever life springs up from, there wells up in our lives, even at their darkest moments, and perhaps maybe especially at their darkest moments, a power to heal and to breathe new life into us. Every man or woman is something of a mystic, because every man or woman at one time or another experiences it in the thick of their joy or in the thick of their pain, a power out of the depths of life to bless them. They say different religious traditions call that by different names. We call it the Spirit of God. But what matters is that we open ourselves to receive it, that I address it in prayer and allow myself to be addressed by that power, and that I move in the direction which that power of God seeks to, to move me, moving to fuller union with God and fuller union and love and care for, for one another. You might ask me, though, how do we find assurance in a secular world, in a world where many find life absurd? How do we find assurance of that kind of trust, that that power of life is there and that it's on my side? Before I take a look at that, I want to say that one of the things that gives me tremendous hope about the church today is its, it's, its openness to, 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 you know, to, to, to many other things in, in the world. It's openness to other Christian churches and their richness. It's open to the tradition, the rich tradition of other world religions. It's openness to the rich experience that many people have of the world in which we live, and especially to the greater awareness today through ecology of the richness and mystery of nature all around us. I just want to mention a few things. Even the very earliest pages of the Bible speak of the wonder of the rainbow. Isn't it an extraordinary phenomenon? we find mentioned so colorfully in the opening pages of the Bible, that after the storm, after the thunder, this extraordinary phenomenon lights up the sky, leading us to believe that somewhere beyond the clouds of my life and beyond the rain and beyond the darkness, there may be a thousand rainbows, miracles that God is ready to shower upon me. During the holidays, and just a few, a week ago or so, on the 8th of August, there was this glorious full moon, beautiful moon, full moon riding the sky. Now we know the moon has no light in itself. It's a dead and dark body. But just to think to go light up the whole earth where, where, I, where I was walking anyhow on, on that night, leading me to think that maybe I haven't much in myself, like the moon, there's a darkness, more conscious of my darkness than my light. But maybe like the moon, there is a power out there that can give me light and let me to shine with that kind of glory for others if only I let it happen. I've spent a while working in Africa. I remember once leaving a little airport at the foot of the great mountain of Kilimanjaro, you know, and it was, it was a kind of low cloud. And we left the little, um, little airport of Arusha, climbed up through the cloud, and there, right, right at our feet, was this glorious mountain, the highest mountain in Africa, mysterious mountain, you know, of, 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 um, uh, of Kilimanjaro. Just that the memory of that has stayed with me, reaching up out of the clouds, they're towering over the world in such a great majesty as mountains like Kirkpatrick and many others have been to us often an image of the glory and the majesty of God. I went to two films this summer, one was a film called The Taste of Cherries, about a man about to commit suicide. I only have to say this very briefly. He's on his way to commit suicide. When somebody offers him, a child, I think it was, you know, a, a few cherries, red cherries are beautiful fruits. And he tasted them, ate two or three of them. And suddenly, the kind of, just, just the cherry, the taste of the cherry, the beauty of the earth in which we live, its fruitfulness, 
the taste of cherries brought home to him just, just the preciousness of human life and made him stop what he was about to do. The other film I saw was a film called Gabby. I noticed that Time magazine voted it one of the ten best films of, of the year. It's a story around the making and the weaving of Persian carpets. Anyhow, it just brings to mind a lovely parable, which means a lot to me. You know, a Persian carpet is made on a vertical frame, you know, to stand it up in, in a stand-up vertical frame. The great artist, the weaver artist, sits on one side, and the boy who's helping him to make the knots sits on the other side. Now, when the boy makes a mistake, or inadvertently changes the plan of the weaver, but he makes the knots not in the way he should make them, the artist doesn't change what he has done. He alters the pattern. We are the ones, like the boy, we're working on the blind side of the carpet. We make mistakes. We do things wrongly, unawares, wittingly or unwittingly. Our plans go wrong. We stumble. We make mistakes. We do foolish things. But God does not kind of, as it were, sort of wipe those out. He takes what we have done and weaves that somehow wonderfully into the ultimate pattern that emerges. To me, it's a lovely story that God can take even the sins of my life, even the foolishness, even the mistakes, even the things that shouldn't happen to me, maybe like sickness or failure or, or whatever, and somehow can weave them into making me something more beautiful for God. I think that's one of the greatest things that gives me hope, that God can take even the sin of my life. Sure, it shouldn't have happened. He can somehow use it in some way for some greater good to make me a more humble person, a more, 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 more caring person or, or, or whatever. So the important thing is that we use what we have been given, even when we use it foolishly. That God, the great weaver artist who sits on the other side of the curtain, can take everything that I have done, even the good and the bad, and weave it into a picture beyond my wildest imaginings. And so we listen to that first reading. You know, you mightn't have catched it all or even remember it. It's about Elijah, and he's discouraged. The wicked queen Jezebel is after him, and all his walk is about to go down the drain. He's extremely discouraged. He treks across the desert, physically and mentally exhausted, sits under the broom tree, and asks God to end his life. He's had enough, and he's ready, he says, to die. But what happens? God does not summon Elijah to an early death but rather summons him to an engagement in his life right now, after he has recovered. And I like to see in that story of Elijah, the people, many of them here with us today, I'm sure, many of us at all times in our, our life, who are discouraged, who are hurting, who feel they have reached the bottom, who just sit beneath the broom tree and wait to die, and plead sometimes even maybe for God to take, to take their life. But God does not invite them to finish their life to be ended. Rather, he invites them, like Elijah, back to life in a new way and, and, a new, and a new wisdom. And so we have people always, people here today, who sit beneath their broom trees. They have suffered loss, perhaps the loss of a spouse through divorce. Whatever words we color with, divorce is, is lousy, hurting so many people. Loss through death, you're a widow or a widower. Sickness, struggling with sickness and weakness and fatigue, or grief, disappointment or profound hurt from somebody. These are the things you perhaps people have struggled with for years, addiction or alcoholism or whatever. And yet the gospel comes along or the Bible like to tell us, like the story of Elijah, that God wants us to, yes, to rest a while under the broom tree, to catch our breath again, but then to engage in life to engage in life, in life once more. And so I think too that the message of Elijah is to pray for those under the broom tree, the people that you know, and many of you have come today here I'm sure to pray for people like that. Those we think of the couple so drowned so tragically in Wexford a few days ago, the people killed so tragically in an accident, two Dublin people who have relatives in our own parish killed and on the way down I think to Limerick. There are spouses who are destroying each other's lives, 
There are people who are depressed, there are people who are sick, there are people who are just sad and people who are hurting. All kinds, all kinds of, 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 of people sitting under their broom tree and wanting to die. And so we who are this afternoon here at this liturgy, when in your name later I lift up the pattern, you know, with the bread and the wine, I'd like you to mention someone by name and to really mention them by name and say, I'm laying this person's name on the pattern and in this chalice, lifting up to God because I know they sit under their broom tree and I know they need my prayers. So many of us at one time or another, like Elijah, have been through the desert. We've been chased maybe by wicked people and the wicked Queen Jezebels of this world. We're tired and weary. and We're asking God, sometimes anyhow maybe, to end it all. But the good, that story says, just, just be still. Sit quietly under the broom tree. Listen to the invitation of the Lord, calling me to a newness of life. A new, a new, a new beginning. You know, we came along the road coming from Dublin this morning. And you can see that I think the council now in various or corporations in various towns and, and along the road are supplying people with these new kind of tip-up bins. I just want to say, God keeps no rubbish bins. God does not ever discard anyone. God refuses nothing that is offered. He has a special affection for ordinary people. He has made so many of them. And especially those ordinary little people who are humble or who are hurt or who are sick. Jesus puts it so wonderfully in the gospel. Come to me, all you who are weary and overburdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, me, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. One of the greatest you know, spiritual man of our time, a great Jewish rabbi, was once asked, what message do you have today for young people? And here's what he said. Let them remember there is a meaning beyond absurdity. Let them be sure that every deed counts, that every word has power, and that we all can do our share to redeem the world in spite of all absurdities and all frustrations and all disappointments. And above all, let them remember this, that God wants to make out of their life a work of art. And that is our faith. And we stand on the threshold, you know, of the Feast of Our Lady, of the Feast of the Assumption. Somebody once, I think it was Cardinal Sunans, asked uh, the great Catholic theologian Karl Rahner, he said, tell me, Karl, why has devotion to the Virgin Mary declined among so many young Roman Catholic people today? Ah, Rana replied, you see, too many young Roman Catholic people of today have turned Jesus into an idea and an abstraction. And you know, he said, abstractions don't have mothers. God is not an abstraction or an idea. God is a God with skin on. A God who drew his heart from his mother's heart and his blood from her blood. A God perched on his mother's knee in those lovely designations of Our Lady. A God drawing his milk from his mother's breast. A God gazing out at us in those great icons with his mother cheek to cheek. That's the woman of the gospel that we honor tomorrow. My uncle who was a priest in America used to love to say, we're all related to God on our mother's side. And what a lovely thing it is to think that God had a mother whom he loved. And the Feast of the Assumption is surely about that heaven could not be heaven for him without his mother. And so Mary in some extraordinary way brings God down to earth. Literally, of course, she did bring him down to earth. But to think that God had a mother whom he loves somehow makes him like one of ourselves. We all know what it means to have a mother whom we love and brings God down to earth, down to earth for, 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 for us. I'd like to finish with the thought. When Dublin celebrated, I live in Dublin, celebrated its millennium, you know, I think in 1988, they, they built what they call a time capsule, you know, in a great kind of... Uh, seal box they put in all the kind of things that would tell people the way Dublin people lived 
in, 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 you know, at the end of their first millennium. Pictures of people, how they dressed and how they spoke. They even put in some of the water of the Liffey that people would know what that Liffey was like in a thousand years' time. And they buried it up there somewhere then uh, near the city hall uh, or Christ Church that people would open it in a thousand years' time and know how the people of Dublin lived. What I would like to think that the people who I do not know with this great basilica, what will remain of it in a thousand years' time? Can any of us know? But I would like to think that those who dig up our time capsule here from your this blessed place of Knock would know that the people who came here over so many years, you know, since the first apparitions at, towards, towards the end of the 19th century, that those who came here were a people that kept alive the memory of Jesus, this man of Nazareth, and, and his mother and what they were like. A people who in those lovely words of the, God, of the Old Testament, that they would know of you, that you were a people who acted justly, who loved tenderly, and walked humbly with your God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.